So I want to talk about a locator service and how we're taking advantage of it in our architecture for RTS 21. So if you look at the RTS 21 architectural digest, this is the first one that's in it. And I think probably one of the most pivotal for our general communications between this and observer is going to be our two most likely items to be used in here. Okay. So inside of this, uh, we see that the basic reason for it is that singletons are bad, but are necessary. And they're not necessarily necessary as we're seeing we have a workaround here, but I'm calling it without what that is. So a singleton, in case you're not aware, is just basically where you have a static reference to a class that you can call from anywhere very easily. You see examples of this in Unity all the time through things like Scene Manager, where you can access things like Load Scene. Um, or, well, whatever other commands you might find in there, or other classes that give you access to things very easily, like gameobject.find, and that will find stuff within the scene. So those ones are usually considered a very bad practice. Now, the reason that they're considered a bad practice is for testing. That's the biggest reason why. Because in testing, you want to be able to control the state of what's being used. And if all the states are statically managed like that, you cannot control them very easily. The entire world is already set up. So if you become unaware that this is also that the class changes and it now has some sort of analytic system tied into it and logging system and other some other system attached to it as well, you're calling other systems in the world and you don't necessarily know that where the state of your game leaves off. So with static instances, you usually want to keep those as things that don't manage state. Okay. So the solution that we have is by using the locator service, which basically means that when we have an instance of a class that we want to access later, we are going to pass it into the locator and then based on type, such as interface, we are going to ask for it back at various points in the code. Usually, I recommend that we use interfaces for this. Sometimes there might be a reason to specifically use an abstract class, for instance, or another reason that you can just use a class if there's nothing on top of it. But interfaces usually help save us from a lot of stresses. At least, if it, at least it gets rid of a huge of a huge amount of extra noise that show up from something being a mono behavior or some other type by getting rid of any all of the extra functions. Okay, so there's really only two methods, technically three if you're testing, but the two key methods that we're using are get and assign. So get is where we are getting a particular type. We're saying locator get i player manager and that will return to us the current player manager so we now have this object that we can call on to get information about the players and our current player and dive in for more details then we also of course have the assign function which allows us to set a current set an object as whatever type we want to use now that's uh, if we're depending on a mono behavior for instance that shows up a little bit late we might say locator.assign and we assign that particular mono behavior in here um, in some cases that works in some cases that doesn't i will express the difference when we get to it okay another one is that we can just assign it to another type which basically means that we are saying that when you get iplayer manager we're just going to assign player manager to it. And then the first time you call get, it will construct a new instance of player manager and return it and store it so that the next time it returns the same value. So everyone gets the same object instance unless someone assigns something later on. Okay, and then this last one over here is where you assign it based on a function. Now, this can be a really great way to think of a factory class where you don't even have to build a factory or a factory method. So in this, you can assign a function that will basically execute. Now, the function has no parameters. It is just you execute the function, and then that ex creates the object and returns it. Of course, when we do that, whatever object it returns, it also assigns its instance right away so that the get will not have to repeatedly create new ones every single time, which ideally is not what we want it to do. If we have something that's creating new instances of stuff every single time, then we should approach that differently. For instance, a factory class in specific. Okay, so let's take a look at this in code. So when I go over to the code, 
I'm taking a look at this and I'm seeing uh, it's really just made up of a dictionary of types. So when we're saying we're assigning a particular type and we're setting an object, inside of here we are passing in a function that returns that object. So that could be anything. That could be literally a function wrapped around an instance that says return this instance. Um, in fact, when we do this, when we are assigning that specific instance to it, we can see that is exactly what we're doing. We're just saying, hey, return the instance. And that's it. That's all that it does. So additionally over here, we also have the assign type. So when we're calling on that one, this one's fairly simple as well. Um, all that it's doing is it's checking, does it already exist? If it does, that only changes whether or not we are setting it uh, or we are adding it. So in this case, in both instances, uh, we just tell uh, the activator to create the instance of whatever that is. And that should work. That's not going to work for mono behaviors. Create instance on activator does not understand mono behaviors, cannot make the C++ t uh, references that it needs to tie in to make everything... <coughs> Excuse me. In the Unity game object work. <coughs> Excuse me. Unity game engine work. All right. So... The other one that we had here was for the function call. Now remember, this already is a function. So really, this is just passing that function in. It calls, here's the constructor, and then we pass in the function as the constructor. That's it. Um, that's really straightforward. The only reason that we have to put this extra layer in front of it is because in this case, it's a function of an abstract type, and it's going into a function of an object. And even though this abstract is limited to a class, um, oh, which I don't actually have in here. Somewhere it's in here. Um, anyway, I think it's this one maybe? Yeah, where abstraction is class. When we're getting it, we can only get abstractions as class, so this one returns null. Um, but normally, when you're using generics, you can't override a particular type inside of there. So that's why I have this extra function layer where we're basically just using a null object type. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple examples of this and a special case that's going to stand in between here as well that we'll want to take a look at. So inside of here, um, let's see, coroutine manager is not the one that I wanted to show initially. Right click event. Right click event, I think, is a really good example. Or was it interaction manager? Construction finder? One of these had a really good example that I liked, um, but then I lost track of which one it was. Interaction manager, was that? Oh, interaction manager, and then assign interaction manager, right-click event. That's not what I'm looking for. This one, RTS event system, F12. Okay, and is this the one? No. <laughs> I have completely lost track of one of the references that I want to display in this. So... Give me just a second to go find it. Construction manager. Oh, here it is. It's the construction finder manager. Okay, so construction finder manager is basically something inside of our classes, if I remember right right now, that is helping us define a location that we can construct a building. So we have a manager that helps us find that location. But it's also using both the get and the assign function, which makes it a great example to use. So inside of here, when we are first going awake, awake is the point in code where mono behaviors need to be setting themselves up on the locator if they're going to be used like that. So in this one, we can see this is in fact a mono behavior, which the awake function should have given it away anyway. But we have the awake function here, and we are saying that if somebody asks for an iConstruction Finder Manager, they're going to get this specific instance. And that works for this. For all of the stuff that's interacting with this, there's no problem with it. Um, additionally, on the start function, we are now asking for the interaction manager, a different class. Now, the reason that we're doing this on the start function is because the awake function is reserved for getting uh, or assigning objects. So by the time the start, uh, it, get, it comes down to executing the start functions, all of the awake functions have executed, and then I interaction manager should become available. If you get to a start function and something is not available, it means something was not set up right. Okay. So that's our base of operations of how that works. 
So there is a special case here, though. Um, let's say that I have a class that does need to have a mono behavior because it's depending on some of the unity code that requires scene interaction or object interaction that just needs to be done or called at the right time and guaranteed it. Um, so a coroutine is a great example of that. See, we could spin up additional threads to fire things off and execute them, but the coroutine manager has a lot of value to it, especially in the fact that it can start to be distributed off to its own threads, depending on the system and structure that you have set up. And then Unity can manage that uh, a lot better than, or a lot easier, because they have a pretty good system in place for it. Anyway, well, we have an instance where our coroutines might still be executed or called before Unity has even fully started, before our scene has loaded, before we've even gotten to the first start function. So we have two classes to manage this. We have our coroutine manager, which as you can see here is just a class with two interfaces on it. It does not have a mono behavior or any other object type it inherits from. And then we have coroutine manager behavior, the same name, but behavior on the end. This one inherits from mono behavior. This one is where we actually execute the coroutine. So we have this function on it called run. And, it, and inside of it, we call the start coroutine. And you can see it's got an interface on here. So when it's called, there's the method and we pass in the, uh, the enumerator. Now, if we need to expand on this later, we can always add more functions. The ability to pause, stop, delay, get results back and forth, test something about it, whatever it might be that we need to add features for. Um, but for right now, this is all that we need for this. Now, the coroutine manager is something that if I go to locator and go to our initialization, we can see in our initialization that we have a coroutine manager that we just expect to be available. This is happening before the scene loads. But it also has something else down here. When I see coroutine manager, or sorry, I coroutine manager, you see it's also getting the coroutine manager here. Now this line over here is a little bit weird um, because we are saying locator.assign I coroutine manager setup. And inside of it, we are passing back I coroutine manager setup from whatever we got from I coroutine manager. Now, this is a special hack. There is no guarantee that these types will be tied together. We have to develop it that way. This is a special pattern that I'm using to that for Unity in specific. So in this one, uh, we can see that this is looking for I coroutine manager setup to basically call a method inside it to say set its behavior to this. So it's making sure that this coroutine manager that is always available, it shows up immediately, uh, will all of a sudden at some point in time get the behavior. It'll get the actual mono behavior and be able to call the run functionality. So the coroutine manager has a special state management system inside it that you'll want to know about because the times that we're doing this, it's usually important to, uh, to, to do this. Um, so in this case, since it can be called before we actually get our scene operational, we need a couple special things in here. One is we need the actual behavior. We need the reference to the coroutine manager behavior so that we can call our run coroutine. So if someone says, oh, hey, execute this, road, uh, this coroutine, um, well, it's going to ask the behavior to run the coroutine. That's all that it really does. It's kind of a glorified wrapper layer sitting on top of coroutine manager behavior. But it's doing this extra step here. It's saying if it doesn't exist, if we don't have that behavior yet, well, add it to this list of coroutines, this list of I enumerator functions. Okay, so now let's say that we finally set the behavior. So we pass in the behavior. So we set it. Great, that's awesome. Now we're going through everyone that's waiting on it, and we pass them in and start executing them. This gives us our chance to start executing all these things that have been waiting for the scene to first load. Um, so now we're actually guaranteeing that we're executing them. Great, now we can move on in our code. So that's the example of where we have 
two different classes being used to manage one set of functionality. It's something that effectively we need inside of Unity. So let's say we also were using the www network service to be able to send out communications. Like maybe this was going to be used on WebGL, for instance, and then that's really our only key form of communication. Uh, that still needs to be assigned to a game object, but maybe we want to start sending messages out before a game object is even loaded or before the scene is even fully loaded. Well, we can at least queue up the messages we want to send out until that becomes available. And then things like our analytics system can begin pushing things and getting stuff set up without having to worry about queuing everything else up itself. Anything that can will just pass itself off right away. And if something needs to be delayed, for instance, a driver connection, such as the mono behavior version for WWW or the uh, coroutine manager, those will handle those delays, the lag. All right. That's the key events for the locator service. Anytime that you need access to something, use it, uh, go ahead and call it, but use it sparingly. Use it at the startup to assign functionality throughout your code. So in the start function, I am setting this dot interactions, which is over here. That's where we get it. That's where we set it. And now I can use interaction manager in my code.